Uh, and Janie, uh, we turn to you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, just gonna turn on my timer. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just wanna start off with a, a, a thanks to Traff Lab for including me and especially to Ila. Ila has been my intellectual beacon for me for so many years. I've learned a tremendous amount um, from her ever since, well, particularly from her labor approach to human trafficking article. And I have been so excited to watch her ideas come to fruition through the policy, very concrete policy recommendations that you're producing through Traff Lab. So it's it's thrilling to see this report <laughs> come out. Um, it's so long overdue in this field, as we all know. Um, and I'm also just thrilled to be on this, this panel with with so many scholars whose work I've, I've admired uh, for so long over the years. Um, so um, I, uh, just by way of background, my scholarship uh, has focused on anti-trafficking policy um, in the context of international law um, and also US foreign policy. I like to go after the US government on, on what they do in terms of influencing how other countries or attempting to influence how other countries address trafficking. I've also looked at um, migrant domestic work in, in the uni United States more broadly, particularly in the context of au pairs and, and migrant domestic workers who are hired by diplomats, so grappling with diplomatic immunity issues um, uh, and the role of philanthropy so in, in anti-trafficking uh, policymaking. And so um, the conversation we, we've already had um, just makes me want to go back to those articles and, and revisit some of those ideas and, and and because uh, um, I'm already learning so much. Um, so I wanted to, or I was asked to talk about my work on, on uh, global migration governance, which has been the focus of my research more recently. Um, I've been looking at the, the role of the International Organization for Migration um, uh, in, in global migration governance and what that means for the anti-trafficking field. Um, and, uh, and also the role of the UN Global Compact on migration, which I'll refer to as the G GCM, um, which really establishes the IOM as the lead, uh, global lead agency on migration, which, which I have some concerns about, um, as I'll talk about. Um, so just to start off, you know, in the, in the realm of migration governance, and I think, um, uh, you know, the, the alternative plan does a great job of, of setting up the, the field. Um, I think, you know, as the alternative plan mentions, you know, in the, in the realm of migration governance, um, migration law, international migration law, we see um, uh, a really thin <laughs> treatment of, of economic migrants. The bulk of international migration law is focused on the protections afforded to refugee asylum popula asylee populations. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've always drawn a distinction between, in international law, between uh, refugees and economic migrants. The former are viewed as deserving of protection, affirmative protections by virtue of their victimization by their governments, um, whereas economic migrants are viewed as masters of their own fate and less deserving of, of protection. And so, you know, because of that, we see um, a very thin a set of, of treaties dealing with with economic migrants, and and you know this is all rooted in, in concern of, of over sovereignty and this this idea that migration has come to be known as the last bastion of sovereignty, and therefore not appropriate for development as a as a matter of international law. But that 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 view shifted over time. I think with the 2015 uh, mass migrations, um, which led to the New York Declaration, which then led to the UN Global Compacts. There's one on refugees, one on migrants. Um, but undergirding that, setting the stage, I think, for the, the, the development of the Global Compact was um, a, a bigger story about how migration finally crept into the international agenda through the back door of development. Um, you know, starting in 2006, then UN, uh, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan instituted a series of high level, level dialogues on migration and development, pitching migration as an undertapped vehicle for development. Um, and so we saw this uh, building of migration, what, what scholars refer to as migration optimism, right? The sense that migration will be the solution to development. 
Um, and over time, you know, in different decades, there's been migration pessimism and optimism. There's been sort of a pendulum swing um, as to views on development. And we are firmly entrenched now, I think, in the view that migration is the solution to development. Um, and we see that reflected in the 2015 Agenda for Sustainable Development. You know, the Millennium, De the M Millennium Development Goals did not mention migration. <laughs> um, the, the 2015 Agenda um, explicitly links migration to development. Um, so I wanted to set this, the stage, you know, those high level dialogues really sort of, you know, created, really provided kind of a confidence building exercise to lay the foundation for states to be more receptive to coming together to, to do something on international migration, which they did in the form of the global compact, which is not a binding treaty, but it's significant nonetheless, because it, I think it signifies the international communities long overdue recognition that it can't ignore economic migration anymore and that cooperation is necessary. But it's important to know that the GCM is not a human rights instrument. Its provisions attempt a very careful balancing of three competing concerns, border security, access to flexible labor markets, and migrant protection. Um, and as I said before, it anoints the IOM as the lead global migration agency, which is not an agency that has been known for its um, for holding rights protection at the core of its mandate. And in fact, it, its constitution sets up the, the entity as a, a member services organization. It doesn't have, unlike UN agencies like OHCR, OHCHR or the ILO or UNHCR, um, it does not have a normative mandate and it explicitly uh, takes a non-normative, uh, it, it has in, uh, in 2015, 16, um, the IOM joined the UN as a UN related organization, which is a special status that not many organizations have. Um, but in the agreement, the IOM um, explicitly, the agreement explicitly allows for IOM to remain a non-normative institution. So it will not, as a matter of its constitution, adopt a normative protection mandate. It also maintains its independence from the UN. So it's, it's not, subject to the UN sort of accountability mechanisms that um, UN, actual UN specialized agencies would, would be subject to. Um, so it's important to recognize what IOM is. And so now we have this entity in the role of recognized lead agency on migration. Um, and so I think it's important to look at this. Um, I think, you know, the recommendations uh, in, in the alternative plan that I love you know, the, the many chapters dealing with binding and recruitment and, and the role of placement agencies, you know, these uh, ideas come up in the Global Compact on Migration, right? Um, objective 10, so the Global Compact migration, on Migration, you know, includes a number of objectives. There's one specifically on trafficking, Objective 10, um, which kind of tracks the dominant anti-trafficking response that, that the, the alternative plan rightly criticizes in terms of what it emphasizes. It's just sort of more of the same. But what I find exciting about the GCM is objective six, which deals with facilitating fair and ethical recruitment and safeguarding conditions for decent uh, work, for, for ensuring decent work. Um, I think that's much more promising of an objective to, to dealing with the structural causes of trafficking. But whether or not IOM at the helm <laughs> will meaningfully advance that objective, I think remains to be seen. Um, you know, IOM historically, you know, it's, it was in operation for about 70 years before it joined the UN as a related organization. And it's known for its normative ambivalence. It's got a checkered history of rights protection. I will say in the realm of trafficking and its resettlement, of trafficked persons. It's sort of known for, for doing some really good work um, for protecting trafficked persons, uh, particularly on their return to their home countries. Um, but it's also got sort of a checkered history of rights protection when it comes to immigrant detention and, and working with governments to create offshore detention facilities for asylum seekers. It's, it's um, engaged in the promotion of labor or establishing new labor migration corridors without in, without sufficient attention to the rights of the migrant workers. Um, so part of this is due to the IOM structure. It's a project-based organization. It, it, it doesn't have core funding for its projects like other institutions. And so each of its 500 plus offices around the world have to 
raise their own money through projects to justify their existence. And so sort of getting to, to Joel's point about the politics, it's important to, to recognize the politics behind how IOM functions, right? Um, because it is a pro projectized organization, um, it has had all of these offices have had to be very entrepreneurial. And, and so they've taken on projects largely for Northern countries, <laughs> um, uh, which tend to focus on border control, um, far more interested in border control and, and border control and access to flexible labor markets than, than migrant protection. And that is borne out in many of its projects um, in support of, of promoting labor mobility. Um, uh, and so I think it's important to recognize that. And so when ILM became the lead agency, it raised, there were understandably a lot of questions raised over whether or not the IOMs joining the UN system would simply result in the blue washing of IOMs sort of problematic activities when it came to rights protection, um, whether the IOM would continue to serve the interests of wealthy states, um, the US in particular, <laughs> um, that have funded its projects um, and, and that have you know, been at the forefront of resisting any sort of meaningful global migration governance, right? Um, there's been a benefit to fragmentation <laughs> from the perspective of northern uh, northern states. Um, or I guess the other alternative is that perhaps IOM will through osmosis <laughs> um, or maybe through its mandate as the lead agency of the UN migration network. So IOM is now positioned to be the lead agency for about almost 40 different UN agencies on their work on migration. And so um, there are terms of reference for that role and the terms of reference actually make very explicit that the network's going to prioritize the well-being and rights of migrants. Um, and so there is something there, um, notwithstanding IOM's non-normative mandate to, to, to have some hope <laughs> that the IOM will be more rights protective in its approach now that it's part of the UN family. Um, but I think that largely remains to, to be seen. Um, and so um, I think, you know, I think one, uh, one area that I've, I've, I've focused on in the work of IOM, because it has pitched it as an anti-trafficking measure, has been its work on recruitment, ethical recruitment. So IOM uh, started a project known as IRIS that um, was is a multi-stakeholder initiative with a goal of promoting ethical cross-border recruitment. Um, it's pitched as an anti-trafficking initiative in, in many in many ways. Um, and basically that initiative, and, and I wanted to look at IRIS because it is it is a place where IOM has actually said that it has a normative mandate. Like it's it's pursuing a protection mandate under the rubric of, of anti-trafficking. Um, and so I thought it was really instructive to look at IOM um, because uh, it, the way it structured its work is really revealing as to its approach, right? And, and I think it's important to look at this because IOM as lead agency will have an influence over that that how you balance those competing interests of border control, access to labor markets and migrant protection. Um, and IRIS, I think, shows us um, the way it's it's structured. So, so what IOM chose to do was to create something known as the IRIS standard, which was its own set of norms. It basically lists the ILO principles and guidelines on recruitment and sort of refashions it as its own. The goal of IRIS is, is to reform the, the private recruitment industry um, through, uh, I think its primary vehicle has been through a voluntary certification process. So the idea is, um, private recruiters can go through iris certification um and and the norms track you know the you know some of the ideas in the alternative plan in terms of no recruitment fees right um uh and and some attention to you know, there's some mention of, of of binding but it's it's mainly focused on on recruitment fees um and so the idea is that private uh recruiters can be certified by iris um and then be promoted as IRIS certified recruiters, meaning they are ethical recruiters. Um, but it's the devil's in the details, right? So if you look closely at IRIS certification, um, the certification is actually outsourced to private, the private audit industry, which itself is a billion dollar industry with its own really long supply chains. And so 
um, uh, I think it, you know, I think there is this sort of sense that, well, if IOM is pushing certification, it's an international institution, um, it must be legitimate. But when you sort of look at the details of how it's doing this, it's, it's allowing for the outsourcing to actors that have not historically been so great on finding, <laughs> finding identifying labor violations, much, much less addressing them. And so when you look at the sort of schematic for what IRIS does, it doesn't correct for any of these problems that we've known for a long time that the private audit industry um, uh, has with respect to its, its inability to address labor violations. Um, as Genevieve LeBaron's work has, has brought out in, in her work on first labor, um, she's exposed how these certifications may be fairly meaningless um, because for instance, you know, the audits are conducted only for uh, on the entities at the top of the supply chain rather than lower down where most of the violations take place. Um, there's no meaningful complaints mechanism. So, um, you know, and when I say meaningful, there's no protection against retaliation for pursuing a complaint about the audit or about a particular recruiter. Um, and so what the IOM ultimately has done, I think, is to promote this idea of governance by private audit. Um, rather than as an international institution, pressing states to regulate, right? To enforce rights protections under international law, which is actually expressly said in the GCM that states should do. And so as IOM, as the lead agency, it really should do what the GCM tells it to do, which is to, to focus on states passing laws to ensure protections. Um, but instead it's forced first foray into dealing with labor migration protections under the rubric of anti-trafficking has been to pursue this sort of private sector um, mediated attempt to inspect labor <laughs> conditions. Um, so it's a, at the end of the day, I think it's reflective of how IOM is very much entrenched in neoliberal economic governance. Um, you know, this sort of greater privatization of regulation has enabled non-state actors to take um, broader roles in, in these governance processes. And I think we need to be really cognizant and not just think, well, IOM is now part of the UN, it's gonna be okay because IOM's particular approach is not one that's really consistent with, with, with um, uh, other agencies in the, in the UN that, that, that have a normative protection mandate. Um, and I, I sort of wanted to issue this caution because migration optimism is, is on the rise. Um, we're seeing, I mentioned philanthropies before, we're seeing um, particularly libertarian philanthropies um, funding organizations that want to promote labor mobility. But uh, some of these organizations are quite explicit about um, accepting rights trade-offs in exchange for access to labor markets. And, and, and we're seeing, you know, I've seen some of these organizations double in staff over the last six months because the infusion of funds and getting to Joel's point about who's financing this. You know, there's a proposal that one organization has put out that, well, we should bring in uh, private investors to create, help fund seed, seed, provide seed money for a migrant welfare fund that, so they would put in the initial funding and ultimately migrant workers would pay fees into the fund. And that fund would cover recruitment fees. That fund would also cover any sort of social services that migrant workers need, right? And so there's sort of this opt out of the from the state in terms of regulation and inspection and provision of social services. Um, and instead trying to privatize the whole system for migrant worker protection um, funded by migrant workers ultimately but uh, structured in a way that ultimately will be profitable for private investors. <laughs> um, and so that's where we're at. And I think we need to be really cognizant of, of that as, as a growing influence in this space of migration governance under this idea that migration will solve our problems of development um, because they're gaining a great deal of traction <laughs> and it's, uh, it's troubling to have that sort of broader dynamic and also um, IOM's, you know, lack of commitment to, to normative protection um, so far. Although I will say one promising thing is that um, the IOM has see, seems to have kind of abandoned its, its certification process and is now promoting another initiative known as the Global Policy Network 
which is intended to work with governments. And so hopefully, maybe that will be a vehicle for, for IOM to actually engage with governments and encourage them to actually regulate where they should be regulating and funding where they should be funding um, for the protection of, of migrant workers' rights, including the, the many concrete sort of recommendations contained in the alternative plan. So I think that's, that's what I will say for now. Thank you so much, Jenny. This was absolutely fascinating. We had the good fortune of reading this work last year at TrafLab. Um, and you know, I think that the pervading, the pervading view in the literature is still that there is you know, a, a, a governance deficit in the international realm of labor migration. And I think that your work really points uh, to the need to expand uh, this view. Uh, and this was indeed a very uh, thoughtful and somber assessment of this moment in the governance of labor migration and IOM's uh, rise to prominence uh, in this field. So thank you so much.